Well, hello and welcome to Virtual Keswick 2020. Who could have ever imagined that we would end up um, doing Keswick like this? Well, I mean, God knew that we'd do Keswick like this. And Bill Gates had a pretty good stab at predicting that our world would be turned upside down by a pandemic a few years ago. So he sort of knew and I definitely did not know. Uh, and I'm pretty sure that none of you imagined you'd have to endure a summer without a trip um, to Keswick, sitting in a damp tent, enjoying a brilliant mix of great Bible teaching, quite a bit of nonsense uh, and great time with your friends. But it's really great that you've chosen um, to join us. And over the next five days, uh, we've got morning and evening sessions for you to enjoy, all from the comfort of your own sofas. Our aim is to bring you um, the, some of the great elements of a normal Keswick Youth Week to help you engage with God uh, and to learn from his living word. So we've got Bible talks, interviews, prayer, songs, some leaders you'll recognise and some you might not. But we pray that all of this would help to deepen your relationship with God and to help you live for him in your homes and in your socially distanced worlds. Now, have you noticed that during the coronavirus pandemic, we've all expanded our vocabulary? It's a bit like we've been doing a secret English lesson without even knowing it. Words like furlough. I mean, what was furlough before it was a time off work thing? Some of my personal favourites from uh, the COVID vocab bank include words like Zoom, the new verb. Uh, we use it to describe our main way of communicating with anyone. Do you want to Zoom? Uh, or another favourite, upperwear, used to describe the clothes that are visible when you're doing all this Zooming online. Um, have any of you had an email from your school asking you to wear full school uniform for your live lessons? Don't tell me that the rebels amongst you wore regulation shorts or skirts during those things. And then there's the new Cockney rhyming slang for coronavirus itself, Miley Cyrus. Have you got Miley? I'm not sure about you, but I wouldn't want my name being used to describe um, a worldwide pandemic. Now, hope is one of those words that we've all started using much more. I wonder what you think hope means. Let's have a look at this video together. Hope. That's a commonly used word around here. I hope my football team wins the Super Bowl. I hope Johnny asked me to prom. I hope it snows today so I don't have to go to school. I hope I get that job. I get that raise. I pass the test. I score the winning point. I get the car. I don't have to kiss Ann Hilga at Thanksgiving. More seriously. I hope my friend gets better. I hope I do something great with my life. I hope one day there's world peace. Hope. We say it and we hear it all the time. And I don't want to trivialize it or disregard the aforementioned. But honestly, those are temporary things and they're uncertain at best. It's not that they aren't real or that they're wrong. But let's be honest. If your team doesn't win, Johnny doesn't ask you to prom. If it doesn't snow, you don't get that job or the raise or pass the test. If you don't get the car and Ann Hilga happens to smack a big wet one on you, you're going to get through it. And even if your friend doesn't get better, you don't do something great with your life. And even, even if there's never world peace, all of the outcomes are uncertain. And whether they happen or not, the way you want doesn't really change much in the grand scheme of things because it's all temporary. In the grand scheme of eternity, temporary hopes seem frivolous. See, hope in all the above scenarios is nothing more than a wish, like crossing your fingers, closing your eyes, and saying out loud, I hope I get that raise, I hope I get that raise, I hope I get that raise is actually going to make a difference. I mean, you don't know what's actually going to happen at all, right? Yet we wish. We click our ruby heels together, we rub the rabbit's foot and avoid walking under ladders and all that, and we slowly open our eyes to see if the wish came true. Well, let me make a quick distinction. There are things we all hope for in the wishing sense, and then there are things we place our hope in. So can we really call uncertain, confidence lacking, rolling the dice, closing your eyes, ruby clicking, rabbit foot rubbing, wishful thinking hope? Is that what hope is all about? And can we really place our hope in looks or fame or money or power? Shouldn't true hope, ultimate hope, eternal hope be based on truth, facts, something more than a wish, something I can know, be certain of, be confident in? I mean, if that kind of hope exists, then it can change us, encourage us, remove fear, relieve doubt, give us strength and get us through anything, give meaning and purpose to everybody, help us love more, understand more, forgive more, accept more, and it can inspire us to share the source of said hope to anybody and everybody. 
If that kind of hope exists, it changes everything. So does it exist? Yes, and I'll be blunt, it's only found in Jesus Christ because he is the way, the hope, and the life. All other hope is temporary, uncertain, wishful thinking at best. Oh, come on. What if I hope that every little thing's going to be all right, or we all just become non-existent when we die, or that I'll get to heaven because I, I lived a good life? Well, rub the rabbit's foot and roll the dice, Jimmy. Those are uncertain wishes based on flimsy guesses. First Timothy 2, 5, 6 declares, There is one God, and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all. John 3, 16 states, Whoever believes in him, that is Jesus, should not perish but have everlasting life, which is why Paul confidently wrote in Ephesians 1, 18 and 19, You may know what is the hope to which he has called you. Without Christ, we are still dead in our trespasses and separated from God, which makes us godless and wicked. And Job chapter 27 verse 8 says, For what is the hope of the godless when God cuts him off, when God takes away his life? Without Christ, there is no real hope, period. So do me a favor and finish this sentence. I place all my hope in blank. If Jesus isn't in that blank, you have no hope. That pretty much covers it, folks, and I think we can safely say that this thought, this concept, this idea that you can have true hope without God has been debunked. Adios. In the face of a worldwide pandemic, hope is what people have craved. We can't accept all the negative effects of coronavirus. It's too hard, it's too sad, and it's too hopeless. So people have been holding on to hope, hope for a cure, hope in the goodness and kindness in our communities, hope that we will get through this together. Now, like every good Christian get together, we have a theme for our week. And yes, you guessed it, it's hope. It's a clever choice from the Keswick powers that be, but they didn't do it for the popularity vote. Hope is the theme for Keswick this year because in the Lord Jesus, we find real hope. Hope that doesn't let us down or fail us. Hope that goes beyond this broken and sinful world. Hope that will carry us through the darkness of death to the eternal glory of being with the Lord Jesus. Now we're going to be thinking about how we can have such an unshakable hope a bit later when we look at Psalms 1 and 2. But for now, why don't we pray and then I'll hand over to the band for our first song together, How Great Thou Art. Now when you're singing, make sure that you're doing it in a socially distanced, responsible way, but sing out to the Lord Jesus. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for making virtual Keswick possible. Thank you that in spite of what is going on in the world, you never change and your son Jesus is always seated at your right hand, ruling from his throne in heaven. We ask that you would please help us to have great fun together now and that you would allow our hearts to be teachable and changed by your word and spirit working together. Amen. Hi, my name's Andy uh, and joining me in the band this week, I've got the Crossley family. Uh, this is Maisie and he's going to sing for us. Joe on electric guitar and Pat, she's going to play the bass guitar. Behind me, we've got Archie on the drums and over here to my left, uh, Mike is going to be playing the keys. You also might see popping up uh, at some point, Sarah Beatty, who's also going to be uh, serving us musically. We are so excited uh, to serve you this week. And musically, we really hope that the music blesses you and that it points you to the Lord Jesus. And we're going to begin this morning with How Great Thou Art.
going in your um, front rooms. Uh, everyone's been talking about what they've learnt during lockdown. I have certainly learnt that I am not meant to sing alone. I need a congregation to drown me out. I hope you um, don't need that too. Now, how do you feel about rules? Are you a policeman? Do you just love to keep them? You're scared to break them and actually you watch other people just to make sure they're keeping the rules too? Or are you a bandit at heart? You really don't care about the rules or the rule maker. Breaking them doesn't bother you. In fact, you see it as a challenge. Well, whether you're more policeman or more bandit, what's true of all our hearts is that they are naturally rebellious and therefore we don't like authority. We don't like anyone to be in charge of us, whether it's parents or teachers or even the government. But if we're Christians, we should have a different response to that. Even though earthly um, authorities can make mistakes, as Christians, we should respond rightly to their authority and pray for them because God in his word tells us to. If you know Jesus, then you know that we have a perfect ruler who never gets things wrong, who never makes mistakes, and in him our hope is found. Right. It's time to grab your Bibles and your pens. Don't worry, we're not playing one of those Zoom go and fetch games. All weird things we've had to fetch so far in Zoom, 10 shoes, 
uh, a dog. I don't have a dog. Um, and all the ingredients to bake a cake. That was good fun to clear up. Uh, but don't worry, just go and grab your Bibles and your pens. Elfie, um, who usually does week one Keswick, is coming to introduce the Book of Psalms to us. Uh, because that's where we'll be spending our time uh, in these morning sessions. And she's going to lead us through Psalm 2. But before she does that, uh, one of our Keswick youth, um, Cole, is coming to read God's word to us. Now, uh, just to let you know that during the talk each day, about halfway through, we'll have a break um, to listen to a song. And we'd love you to use that time to maybe think uh, about what you've heard so far, maybe catch up on your note taking or pray. But use the time just to think more deeply um, about what we've been hearing from God's word. This is a reading from Psalm 2. Why do the nations conspire and the people plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed saying, let us break their chains and throw off their shackles. The one enthroned in heaven laughs and the Lord scoffs at them. He rebukes them in anger and terrifies them in his wrath saying, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy mountain. I will proclaim the Lord's decree he said to me, you are my son. Today I have become your father. Ask me and I will make the nations your inheritance and the ends of the earth your possession. You will break them with a rod of iron. You will dash them like pieces, like, like pottery. Therefore, you kings, be wise. Be warned, you rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and celebrate his rule with trembling. Kiss his son or he will be angry and your way will lead to your destruction for the wrath can flare up in any moment. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. Elfie, welcome to Virtual Keswick. Thank you. D what, what do you think of our set? I love it, particularly the light. And the real tweeting birds. Actually real ones, yes. not fake ones. I don't know where you'd get a fake tweeting bird or anyway. I'd want a fake tweeting bird, but great. <laughs> they must sell them. Anyway, Elfie, lovely to have you along. Now, Elfie, you and I don't usually do Keswick together, so this is particularly no, special. we're normally on different weeks. Okay, so which week do you usually come to Keswick? Um, so I normally come on week one. Angie and I lead the uh, youth work for week one, and I am on the 11 to 14s team. Great, okay, brilliant. And you're going to be speaking to us uh, in a little bit from the Psalms, I hope. Yeah, we're going to be uh, looking at the first, the opening of Psalms, so Psalms 1 and 2. That's what we're going to be doing together this morning. Brilliant, the birds are excited about the Psalm opening. Of course they are. Um, Elfie, let's just get to know you a little bit uh, better. Um, lockdown for you. Out of 10, one being hideous, 10 being really brilliant, uh, where would you put yourself? I'd say maybe six. Ooh, hasn't quite been high. completely hideous. We've had some really nice moments as a family, um, but it has dragged on, and it's hard, isn't it, to not be able to go out and to do the things that we enjoy and to see the people that we love. Um, and so, yeah, I think I'd we'd probably fall around a six. Okay, not bad. And have you uh, taken up any new skills? Lots of people have been trying new things. I tried drumming, for instance. Oh, impressive. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Actually, you wouldn't say that if you'd heard it, but I tried it. Um, uh, have you tried any new skills? Um, I can think of two new skills I've tried. As someone that, that's not great at playing the piano, I did try and teach mm. our five-year-old how to play the piano. Hold on. You're not good at it, but you I'm decided to teach it, but someone I figured else. we'd give it a go. We've got the time. Um, she's loving it. We'll, well, see. we'll, see. we'll see what comes of that. Your job about. here is done. Um, yeah. I have also discovered how to make a cake without using flour, eggs or butter. And, that um, sounds like the war. Um, very much what, so. <laughs> how did that taste? Pretty much baked oats and fruit. I quite liked it. Nobody else liked it. So okay. I ended up with just a significant amount of very healthy cake. It's probably a bit generous to call it cake. OK. So I'm trying to sell it to everybody in our family. Not so. a skill you'll keep going with. <sighs> probably not. The war cake. OK. Yes. Um, Elfie, I'm going to pray for you uh, before you um, speak to us from Psalm 2. Thank this, you. We all need God's help. So let's um, do that now. Father God, thank you so much uh, for teaching Elfie through um, the Psalms. Thank you uh, for the words that she has prepared with your help. Father, we pray that our hearts would be teachable. Please would we um, learn more from your word and be excited to follow you 
um, because of the hope we can have in the Lord Jesus. For your glory we pray. Amen. Amen. There's a tension I wrestle with often as a Christian, and it's this. The truth I read and the life I lead. Uh, the truth I read about in the Bible of a good God who loves us, who hates injustice and loves to give good gifts. Uh, then I look at the world that we live in, this coronavirus lockdown world where families are losing loved ones. Now, I'm sure there will be many of us watching this stream who have had the deep sadness of losing a loved one over these past few months. This world where racism still hasn't been dealt with, where the poor are continually forgotten and downtrodden. And then I just look at, I look at my own life and I see death of loved ones. I see health problems. I see broken relationships and daily worries and struggles that never seem to go away. They may change, but they never seem to give it a full rest. Uh, and when I look at these two realities, a good God and a struggling world, I feel sometimes there's a bit of a gap. How do we connect the life we lead and the truth we read? Uh, the hope and security the gospel offers and the reality of what this life holds for us. Wonderfully, this week at Virtually Keswick, we are going to be going through a small section of the book of Psalms together. And Psalms is a gift to us because it rests beautifully in this gap, this tension between the truth we read and the life that we lead. Uh, here are my uh, five quick facts about the book of Psalms for you. Uh, number one, Psalms is a collection of 150 different songs, poems and prayers. Number two, most of the Psalms were written by a king in the Old Testament called King David. Number three, there are two main groups of Psalms, lament Psalms and praise Psalms. Uh, lament Psalms are prayed either in the midst of a difficult situation or being worn down by life and waiting for God's promises to pass. And praise Psalms, as the heading might suggest, are songs of praise and thanksgiving, of giving thanks for who God is and delighting in his king. Uh, the book of Psalms is split into five small books and they're all about teaching God's people how to pray through the truths that they know about God. Uh, and fact number five, uh, although we often look at Psalms in small groups like we're going to be doing this week, right from Psalm 1 and 2, right the way through to Psalm 150, there is an overarching story that moves from lamenting life struggles now to rejoicing and worshipping God's King who has conquered this world and reigns forever in Zion. So Psalms is a collection of prayers by God's people struggling to live in this world, yet putting their hope and their delight in God's King. And these prayers are, were transformative for the psalmists who wrote them, and they will be transformative for us too. Now, our main focus this morning is going to be on Psalm 2. However, we're going to backtrack just for a few moments to look at Psalm 1 together, uh, because I think that it will help us grasp more of what's going on in Psalm 2, uh, and in fact, help us as we journey through Psalms together this week. You see, Psalms 1 and 2, uh, they act like a bit of a gateway, two doors working together to open up the entire book of Psalms for us. Uh, so at the start of Psalm 1, let me ask you a question. Feel free to jot ideas down or just to think about things in your head. But if you were to describe a good life, maybe even a blessed life, what sort of things would you say? What, if you had it, would make life either now or in the future complete? Take a few moments just to think. Be honest. Uh, don't try and think what might be the right answer, but reflect upon what you actually think. What comes to mind? I asked a few friends, and these are some of the things they mentioned. Uh, getting on the right university course having a well-paid job, being able to see friends and family again without social distancing, 
going to the park, getting married one day, having great holidays. The list went on. But why? What do those things offer us? I can imagine we might all have had sort of similar lists, or even if a few different things came to your mind, I reckon our end goal is, would be about the same. To enjoy life, to have no worries or concerns, to be secure, to have love, joy, peace, to be comfortable. We are all looking for blessing, aren't we? Uh, we all want it. In fact, it's often the reason we can so strongly feel the disconnect between what we read in the Bible and the life that we lead. Where we see a, in the Bible where we see a God who is all about blessings flowing and the life we lead where blessings constantly dry up. Well, as we turn to Psalm 1, this is the big question that it answers. What does a blessed life look like? And the answer will transform the way that we see the world that we live in. And let me read you a few verses from the opening of Psalm 1. It says this. Uh, blessed is the one who does not stand in step with the wicked or stand, in the, um, or stand in the way sinners take or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. Blessing, real solid, immovable blessing that can't be taken away by coronavirus lockdown or messing up an exam or an angry exchange of words or simply the messy world that we live in. And it's found by delighting in God's word in whatever circumstances of life we find ourselves in. Uh, in case you've got sidetracked by the word wicked here, uh, let me just say the Bible doesn't use the word wicked like you or I might. It's simply describing um, somebody who is rejecting God. But let's get back to uh, what this blessed person is doing. Uh, in these verses, what does this person do? Uh, they don't just read God's word every so often. They delight in God's word. God's word is what they speak to themselves in those moments when the, what we read and the life we lead feel in tension. When we don't get on that uni course, when that relationship doesn't work out, uh, and God's word brings blessing and peace and hope. Now, sad things are still sad. But in those hard times, we have hope. What our hearts long for, found in any and every circumstance, whether good or bad, because we're delighting in God's word. Now, I don't want to guilt trip you, uh, but let's be real for a moment. Are we people who delight in God's word? Are you someone who actually delights in God's word? We used to live by the beach. Uh, during lockdown, I have frequently lamented our move to, the, to London. Uh, and I love to swim in the sea. But there's always a point with swimming in the sea where you've got to commit and get in rather than just dithering on the shoreline. Uh, it's the same as delighting in God's word. For that to be you, you have to get in. Uh, maybe for you, you're a Keswick regular, but throughout the year, you've struggled. You've dipped in and out, as schoolwork has allowed. Uh, you've done a few online things during lockdown. But in reality, you've been dipping your toe in and out, but you haven't actually got in. Uh, maybe you've never done anything like this before, uh, but lockdown seems like a good time to check it out. Welcome. We're really glad to have you. Maybe for you, you've been ploughing on in faith, yet the disconnect between your faith and the world you live in is an ever-increasing struggle. Whatever year you're coming from, our prayer is that not only for this week, but going forward... You would take time to delight in God's word and discover that even in the messy uncertainty of this world, knowing God and his word is the only place that true blessing flows from. Uh, we aren't going to pull much more out of this psalm today, although we could say a lot more. But the big picture, the door of Psalm 1 in our gateway to Psalms is this. 
that blessing in this life comes from, from delighting in God's word, delighting in the truth that it speaks and the hope that it offers in all circumstances that we may find ourselves in. was very much about the individual finding blessing in this life, in God's word. Uh, Psalm 2 is, it zooms out, it's global, and it's focused, the other door in our gateway to opening Psalms up for us, is who we should put our hope in. Uh, hope is our big theme for Keswick this year, uh, not just wishful thinking, not maybe this might work out, but a certain hope. What then does certain hope look like? The answer that Psalm 2 gives is that certain hope is found in a person, in God's king. We are to put our hope in God's king. Uh, these are the two gateways to understanding Psalms. They go hand in hand. You can't do one without the other. If you delight in God's word, you will be putting your hope in his king. So that's Psalm 1, you're delighting in God's word, Psalm 2, you will put your hope in his king. 
So let's take a look at what's going on at the start of Psalm 2. Let me read you uh, just the opening verses. It says this. Why do the nations conspire and the people plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their chains and throw off their shackles. Uh, from individuals rejecting God in Psalm 1, we get world leaders rejecting God in Psalm 2. They conspire, they seek to overthrow God and his king and then to take control for themselves. The rulers set themselves up as God's enemies with a clear intention of defeating him. The most powerful people in the world are teaming up to pull all their energy to take God down. How does God respond? Verse four, he laughs. Now let me take a moment to tell you about our three-year-old Noah. She's a bit of an all or nothing individual and as the lockdown restrictions have eased slightly, she's been allowed to go back to preschool for a few sessions. She loves it. And without fail, on a Thursday morning, these are the first things that we hear scream through the bedroom wall. It is not Thursday today, it is Monday, and my school is open, and I'm going to school, you must listen to me. It is, it is Monday, it is not Thursday. And you know, I look at each other, we laugh with a groan about how ridiculous that she's being. And then we go into her bedroom and we tell her the truth. It's not Monday, it is Thursday. Just because she is insisting that it's Monday doesn't actually change the reality that it's Thursday. It's so ridiculous, we can't help but laugh. And then we reiterate the truth to her. That's how God responds to these rulers. He laughs at how ridiculous they are being, as if just because they have decided that they don't want God in charge, that their decision or efforts change anything in reality. And he reiterates to them the truth of the situation. Verse six, as for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. My king is established. So what is God's king like? Well, we read in verses seven to nine that he is God's son. He doesn't simply rule the nations, he owns them. They are his inheritance and he has the power to destroy them. Uh, that might have taken a turn that we weren't expecting. Right at the start, we were saying how we should put our hope in this king. But this king who has the power to destroy. Well, let's circle back, shall we, to verses one to three. These verses appear somewhere else in the Bible. Let me read you this from Acts 4. This is the early church praying together. Sovereign Lord, you made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our, our father, David. Why do the nations rage and the people plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant, Jesus, whom you anointed. The nations had a laughable plan against an almighty and established king. This king though, Jesus, made the laughable possible because he chose to give himself up rather than dashing the nations to pieces. He allowed them to break him, to kill him on the cross, to make a way for the end of verse 12 to be possible. Blessed are those who take refuge in him. You see, it's not just the nations who reject God's king, we all do. If we aren't trusting God's king, then we are trusting in something or someone else. And the reality is, when Jesus comes back, he is going to say to all of those who reject him, if you don't think that life is found in me, then be without me forever. Friends, we've got to face the fact that one day Jesus will return. And for those of us putting our hope in him, this is brilliant news. You see, the fate of all people is wrapped up 
in who our king is. Hope and blessing is wrapped up in who your king is. Uh, So often the temptation is to look for blessing and hope elsewhere in other kings. Think back uh, to the list that you might have thought of earlier. Um, So often we make those good gifts our kings that we put our hope in. However, our experience of this world, of blessing drying up, of hopes coming undone, and what the Psalms say here is that looking for anywhere, for blessing and hope for today or for tomorrow, in anything or anywhere but God's word and his King Jesus is ultimately empty, both for now and the future. But if you delight in God's word, you will put your hope in his King. Uh, These two doors aren't just a way of understanding the Psalms, they open up life for us. Uh, When we delight in God's word, in any and every circumstance, and put our hope in Jesus, who reigns and is coming back, then the tension of the life we lead and the truth we read is transformed into a love for God and a hope that all that is wrong will become undone because Jesus is returning and he reigns. It's so great to listen to God's word together. I love doing that um, with you guys. But um, I do find it very easy to forget what I've just heard. Get up, leave the tent, leave your sofa um, and just be foolish and forget. So I thought if we chatted it through a bit, it might help us to remember. Um, Elfie used a phrase um, in the talk um, the tension between the truth that we read and the life that we lead. And I just wondered whether that had been true for any of you. Can you think of times in your life? And if so, how has God brought peace to that situation? Yeah, I guess I can uh, think of a time uh, when I was at school. um, I was one of the only Christians in school that I knew of. um, And a lot of people thought it was fun to make fun of me for that. And I guess that's where there's a tension, isn't there? That on the one hand, as a Christian, you think God's supposed to love you. Uh, and yet your life seems really hard because you are a Christian. I think that, that was a real tension. How did God bring peace? Uh, through uh, the help of older Christians like my parents who comforted me and prayed for me. Uh, and uh, just through, point, they pointed me to bits of God's word which said, yeah, sometimes it's hard to follow Jesus. So I saw that God's word was, was true and honest with me and upfront about the life we lead. Hmm. That's interesting. So I have, I've got something similar, but kind of the other way around. So when I was about 14, the way I used to sort of try and make people like me was to try and make them laugh. And when you're 14, that isn't always like wholesome. Um, and uh, I got a bit of a reputation for being the sort of double entendre guy. And um, like I thought I was fine with that to start with. I, I, I kind of became a Christian, I guess, when I was about 12. And I was really keen for it and known for it at school, but like I had a long way, a lot to learn. And eventually I kind of, there was some things in the Bible that talk about our speech being pure and clean. And, and it sort of started to nag away at me. And eventually I sort of thought, well, you know, this is kind of the way I think I can make friends, but actually it's not what God wants for me. And, and actually the sense of peace that came with eventually giving into that and saying, well, you know, if that's the only way I can get friends, then, you know, that's not really going to work. Um, so, yeah, it was, you know, I felt like that took me a while and I had to bite my tongue quite a lot and I didn't always manage to bite it. But, you know, gradually there was change and, and a sense of at least trying to please God with what I said. And when things like that happen, it's, it can be really tempting not to trust Jesus, can't it? To look for other things to delight in, not, not to stand up for um, the Lord Jesus. But... Um, Ben, Elfie, can you think of things that you're tempted to trust in other than the Lord Jesus? Yeah, I think that um, for me, lockdown has really revealed that I'm tempted just to trust in friends. Um, That if I have either the approval of friends or just the enjoyment of spending time with friends, that um, that that can really make my day. Um, And it's not to say that they aren't good things. Uh, I love my friends and they are definitely good gifts. But I think I've become aware during lockdown, particularly, of how much of my um, joy depends upon my friends. And that's been something that's really challenged me, that I've really had to pray in, um, that actually my joy flows from Jesus. And it's great to have friends, but actually they're not where my joy is rooted. Lockdown's been interesting for me in a similar way. Uh, For me, often I kind of trust in myself 
So I kind of think I, I can do it. I can fix things. I can get it right. I can trust in me and, uh, and do it. And, and what lockdown's done is it's kind of meant that uh, it's just really patently obvious that I can't do it myself. Yeah. Um, and it's re just really helpful for me because it, it shows me that actually I need to trust in one who's greater, one who actually has it in control. Uh, and so that's been really helpful for me. And so how can we do that? How can we trust in the one who has greater control than we do? I guess in the talk we talked about delighting in God's word. How can we practically do that? Yeah, you see, I wonder whether, again, it's a case of coming to God's word, uh, but delighting in the God who we find there. Uh, that actually, as I, as I read of uh, Jesus on the pages of scripture, delighting in who he is, hearing his promises for me. Uh, and that makes me excited about listening to what he's got to say to me. I think I find two things helpful. One is to make it a discipline, so to try and do it every day. Because I think if I only read God's word when I feel like it, you know, it's not there when I really need it. Um, and the, the other thing, I think, is, is to recognise that it, it, God's involved. So to pray before I read the Bible, to pray after I read the Bible, to pray about what I read in the Bible, that all makes a difference to me. That's a really good idea. And, and helping each other do it, I find it really helpful when people say, are you reading a Bible? Um, because I can get out of the habit of doing it and it's really helpful to have people remind us um, what difference does knowing King Jesus make to your daily life uh, I think for me I've got lots of friends and family who aren't Christians and I love them dearly and it's really easy to look at their lives and go that's better um, it's really easy to look at um, the things that they have and um, they can just go out and get whatever it is that they want. And I just go, that just looks easier and it looks more blessed. Um, and actually, when I take a step back and I pray and I look at what Jesus offers us and um, just the comfort that his word brings as well, I, I think it just brings me back to reality that actually he is where true blessing is found and he is where true hope is found um, for today and for the future and just delighting in my relationship with God rather than in the good things that he gives me. That's really, are we all in agreement? Anything to add? To... Yeah, I, I, the only thing I'd add is, is that I think, you know, some, I, I have some bad days, you know, and, and I think lockdown we've all felt that we in. Um, and I think on those days and when bad things happen and really bad things have happened, you know, um, actually to be able to, to say, but this isn't the end of the story. I know where this story's going. Yeah, it's always easier, isn't it, if you've read the end of the book. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, and so that kind of hope is really huge for me. Well, it's brilliant to talk about having hope in King Jesus with you lot. Thank you. Well, we're at the end of our first morning uh, together and I hope you've enjoyed your first virtual Keswick experience. Go, enjoy your days, uh, whatever you're planning on doing. Be chatting through Psalm 2 with your families, uh, with your friends, just like we did round our barrel. Although you probably haven't got a barrel. Maybe some of you have. Who knows? Will it sink? Will it float? Is it an anchor? Is it a boat? Who knows? Uh, chat round your barrel. And we hope that you can join us this evening live straight from Keswick at 8pm for our evening sessions um, together. Let's pray as we close. Father God, thank you that Jesus rules. Please help us to submit to his authority in our hearts and our lives. Amen.